I'm extremely excited uh, for this session, and it, it uh, I would like to say that it was a, it all planned in advance, uh, but it was very serendipitous. Uh, we are very lucky to have with us today Michael Nielsen and Davida. And uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, and so I'll ask you, uh, what do you do? Uh, okay, so my name is uh, Michael Nielsen. I'm a researcher at Y Combinator Research, which is a uh, uh, sort of basic uh, research institute uh, here, mostly in San Francisco uh, and spread around the Bay Area. Uh, my background, uh, I was one of the early pioneers of quantum computing uh, and also did some of the early pioneer work on uh, open science about 15 years or so ago. Uh, as kind of a hobby project, uh, I finished a book on uh, uh, deep learning and neural nets a couple of years ago. Uh, most of my work uh, sort of day-to-day -day is around tools for augmenting uh, human cognition. So that's kind of the me in 20 seconds. Uh, I'm, I'm Davidat. Um, I am increasingly formally affiliated with Protocol Labs as a researcher. Uh, I was one of the um, original creators of Filecoin. Before that, um, I had uh, a background, varied background from computer science, mathematics to neuroimaging. Uh, I worked on an independent science project for a couple of years called Nemalode, um, where I was coordinating between a bunch of labs, including Janelia Farm, University of Vienna, UCSF, um, working to create a complete model of the nematode nervous system, which is 302 neurons, simplest nervous system in nature. Um, and that project was, was were funded completely outside of the, the usual academic grant writing structure um, by Peter Thiel and, uh, as well as Larry Page. Um, and uh, these days I also do a lot of um, theoretical computer science research in, in type theory, go to a lot of conferences and um, try to build collaborations uh, between uh, academic uh, computer science community and um, some, some projects that are happening in protocol labs. Uh, so the title of this session is How Do We Fix Science? And in the long term, this is one of the core things that Protocol Labs is about. Uh, and we are very lucky to be talking to two people who have formed, who have, an ex have observed a lot of what has happened in science in the past and what is happening now and what the problems are, and who have formed uh, great opinions about what, what is going right, what is going wrong, and how might we fix it. So the, the goal here is to hear some, of, some ideas, maybe touch on interesting projects that, um, that are going on now and what can we learn from them and how might we and other labs um, better position ourselves to do research, to translate that research into production and get, get it into people's hands uh, and also to, inf to help funders decide where to invest in, there's a lot of people that care about the future of science and a lot of the dollars are not going, are not very effectively spent. So, uh, you know, in, in the past a lot of people did fantastic research uh, with a lot less money than today. Uh, so without further ado, uh, what, what is, let's start uh, with what is wrong with science now and then quickly move towards uh, maybe some interesting experiments uh, outside of that. So I I'll ask that to both of you. Uh, Michael, what, is, what do you think is wrong with science today? All right, that, that's yeah, a very small question with which to start. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's tempting to sort of come up with a laundry list, right? To start sort of thinking about your, you know, individual experience. Um, one thing which I think is in interesting to think about is to try and take a sort of a, a large point of view. I'll still be drawing on examples. Oh, uh, he, he, here's a good example. So, sort of one of the most exciting things uh, done in science in the last few years uh, was probably the discovery of the Higgs boson uh, at uh, the LHC. Uh, an interesting fact about this is that there were two papers announcing the discovery. There's about 2,000 authors in total on those. Uh, so back in 1911, uh, Ernest Rutherford announced the discovery of the nucleus of the atom. And uh, that involved one person, uh, Ernest Rutherford, uh, and it was actually done for uh, just a few hundred pounds rather than several billion dollars. Uh, so there's certainly some interesting sort of change in scale. This isn't really something that's wrong with science, but it does make you wonder about the extent to which um, uh, you know, we've hit the point of diminishing returns in at least uh, some uh, area. Uh, so that's at least one, one place uh, you know, to, to, to take a look and, and, and think a little bit about uh, uh, the efficiency of expenditure of money. Same question. Uh, what's wrong with science? Well, I'll go for the laundry list, I suppose. Uh, one thing is uh, people who, who go into science, uh, they, they, the, the large 
largest uh, population of people who are, are working in traditional academic science uh, are, are graduate students. And the, uh, the structure of uh, graduate scientific work requires uh, that each individual human produce a dissertation, a piece of, a piece of scientific contribution that is attributable only to them. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's a lot to be gained from enabling people even very early in their careers um, to collaborate with their peers um, on, on projects where the, the contributions can't be so cleanly delineated. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Another thing is the, uh, uh, the centralization of uh, 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 grant issuing authority and the, uh, the extent to which, uh, uh, Michael, as Michael was saying earlier today, there's a homogenizing force uh, that uh, grant funding flows to certain subfields, which then become more productive because they have more funding, and then they have more publications, so they become more attractive to fund. Um, and this happens on multiple scales, both in terms of, of, of whole disciplines, in terms of subfields, in terms of particular areas of research, and all the way down to individual principal investigators. Um, who you know become famous and then suddenly accumulate far more funding than they can efficiently allocate. Uh, so those are some places to start. Can, can I interject? Totally. Um, so so just as a thought experiment, uh, kind of riffing on that. Uh, one of my favorite thought experiments in in this vein. Uh, uh, you know, the, the world's largest funding agency is the NIH. They spend about forty billion dollars a year. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine two students, for example, in their sort of apocryphal dorm room, deciding to start a new grant agency, and then because they had a much better idea for how to structure it over a period of five to 10 years, scaling it so that in fact they outcompeted the NIH. Um, that sounds ridiculous, but of course that happens all the time in other sectors uh, of our society. And it's interesting to think about, you know, what are the structural reasons why that's not actually possible? And part of the reason why that's not possible uh, with scientific institutions, why they remain so static uh, and thus so fixed in their ways, is that there's no real mechanism to, to kill them off. There's no mechanism uh, for those institutions uh, to die and, and to be outcompeted by other institutions which are better. Right, yeah, I would say Uh, yeah, I would say the uh, a lot of the funding of science comes comes through these public institutions, which have a monopoly because they they uh, they are agents of the agents of federal governments uh, or of the European Union government, etc. Um, and if uh, even in the in the private foundation world, like if you imagined trying to outsource uh, your your private foundation allocation to science, um, to some sort of new startup funding allocation service that was serving lots of different foundations and sort of trying out a new model, it's hard to align the incentives. Uh, uh, you know, it's hard to know that they're not just funding people who happen to be their friends. Uh, and so another direction uh, that's interesting for the future of science is to produce a uh, a mechanism, an incentive mechanism for enabling people to make bets to say this is worth funding um, in such a way that over the long term, if it turns out that it got funded and it was worth funding, that they, they actually have an aligned incentive to make those bets in the in the best way that they can. I want to touch, dig in, into this a little bit deeper. Um, so one of the things that we've been interested in at Protocol Labs, and we think it's a, a very important question in the long term, is credit assignment. Uh, and there, there's, there seems to be a, a significant failure in our society to uh, appropriately reward uh, contributions that are that create a lot of value. So thing, uh, basic science, for example, or, or fundamental discoveries that end up unlocking um, important new technologies, new theories, uh, that then go on to effectively be measured in trillions of dollars of value in, in the economy at large. So uh, I'm curious if you think that, that, that this area is, is uh, uh, that there might be something there or not. Well, I mean, I think there's many uh, sort of individual mechanisms that it's easy to identify. Um, 
I can pick an example. So uh, uh, one is, uh, for example, at, at sort of at the, the level of grant agencies and individual program officers, um, if you as a scientist do you know, a very nice piece of work, uh, you will get a certain amount of reward, certainly in terms of reputation, things like the Nobel Prize and whatnot. Uh, can you tell me the name of any grant uh, agent uh, uh, who funded Nobel Prize winning work? Probably not. And yet those people actually often have to take enormous risks. Uh, a good example, uh, I think one of the most remarkable things human beings have ever done uh, was the discovery of gravitational waves. This really is just a, it's a ludicrous thing uh, to have been able to achieve. They have to measure a change in displacement of one part in 10 to the 21, uh, which is just, just mind boggling. And to do that, a uh, program officer at the NSF had to approve expenditures of several hundred million dollars at a time when they were, I think it's like on the order of 10 to 15 orders of magnitude away from that sensitivity. So that person took a, an enormous risk and has received almost no benefit. So that's just sort of one example where the incentives are terribly misaligned and it's easy, uh, I mean, almost anything that you could do uh, uh, to, to align those a little bit better uh, would, would be an improvement. What do you, uh, do you have somebody to jump into? Or? Oh, yeah, so um, a couple things that, that come to mind that I've heard proposed, um, which are not my ideas, there's a concept of certificates of impact, um, which it aims to provide uh, some, uh, some kind of token that you, you did sort of for, for having created um, or contributed to the creation or to the funding of something that makes an impact in a way that's hard to quantify, um, you can at least be assigned a certificate, and it's not just a certificate to hang on your wall. The idea is that if you then acquire the certificate, uh, you can sell it to uh, to funders or donors or funding agencies who wish that they would have been the ones to have funded that work, who sort of endorse like this being a way for them to spend their dollars. Um, so it requires a lot of different kinds of people to buy in, but it's an interesting concept to try. Um, and another one uh, is a, a concept called idea rights, which is to, uh, when you're creating a, a new discovery, basic or applied, um, it may be possible in, the, in a similar kind of hack as Richard Stallman used for copy left, to release your idea to the public, but under restrictive conditions, uh, essentially require that anyone who profits from using that idea um, give some share back to the original creator. Um, or if you republish or if you create derived works, you have to use the same, you know, in, 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 the, in the same kind of Creative Commons copyleft style virality of licensing. Um, and that this might create the kind of incentives to uh, produce things and share them with the public that have a wide ranging impact, but that are that are really hard to capture the value from initially. And so we could imagine a world where these, um, these would create a tree of, of dependencies over time, and, and if something down the road turns out to be massively valuable, um, but only discovered uh, several layers deep, then that could pro propagate value back. That's right, yeah. And the person who told this to me, uh, John Deming, uh, gave the example that the, the richest uh, family in the world today, if this system had been in place, would be the heirs of Isaac Newton, because so much of the modern world ultimately can be traced back to Newton's formalization of Newtonian physics. Newton, of course, was childless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so let's let's turn maybe to some of the experiments that are going on um, around the world of doing science outside of the of the mainstream, so or or doing research outside of the mainstream. Um, there's a bunch of different examples, uh, everything from open science happening on GitHub, uh, where you know textbooks are being written, uh, discoveries are being made in blog posts, uh, to ranging to things like dynamic lands, uh, with, and to things like, there's a whole bunch of smaller institutes that are trying to, to move things differently. I, I wonder if you have some specific examples that, that you particularly like either because they're doing something novel uh, that you think is on the right track or, or because they're doing something that's, that should be avoided. How many people have been to Dynamic Land? How many people have any idea what Dynamic Land is? Okay. Uh, so uh, Dynamic Land, uh, actually is Luke here? One of the dynamic people? No. Nope. Luke was here earlier. All right. Basically, it's a small independent research lab over in Oakland. Uh, what they're doing is they're building a, a computer, which is the size of a building. Um, and it's meant to be essentially, it, it's, it, 
it, it's a computer you walk into, and every object potentially inside that space is scriptable. Uh, there's very few screens inside there. Uh, they've actually figured out a way where Lots you can make them all. There's a lot of projectors, but but where you can sort of script things uh, uh, in a completely social way. And a very interesting thing, you know, I'm, I don't know, I think every every conversation I've ever heard about what is dynamic land, uh, people always get a little frustrated. I don't understand. I don't understand. You really do need to go and see it. What What is interesting about it is that it's fundamentally different from standard models of computing. And uh, for the purposes of the current discussion, what is, I think, particularly interesting is that the mode of production is very different from any other research lab in the world. As far as I know, none of the people inside that, that group uh, have a PhD. They're not scientists uh, for the most part. They actually have backgrounds as uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, artists, designers, all these different types of things. Uh, unlike a traditional research group uh, where you have kind of a PI at the top, then you might have a few postdocs, and then you have a bunch of grad students who typically are they're being trained. They're not yet super competent. Uh, all of these people are already extremely competent. Uh, there's a whole lot of other, what, what, what am I missing? Oh, a really major difference. They're not producing papers uh, as output, as in a traditional lab. They're, They're producing, producing artifacts and prototypes and, and talks and things like that, and a community experience. In fact, producing a community is one of the main things that they're doing. They're inviting everybody from Oakland and around the Bay Area into the lab. So you sort of run down all these things, and each one of those is a major structural difference from a conventional laboratory. It's such a large uh, structural difference that I think it's very difficult for them actually to uh, to be funded in the traditional way. You go to a foundation and the foundation, I've talked to, to program officers at, at foundations who've, who've been to, to see Dynamic Land and they say, uh, it's really wonderful what they're doing. It's far more original than almost anything else they've ever seen. It's also completely unfundable within their traditional charter. It's, it's just too far outside. Uh, and that, of course, is what makes it actually so important uh, to be supporting that kind of work. So that, that's one of my favorite examples anyway. Um, yeah, I can think of a bunch of, you know, there's um, there's this organization called Protocol Labs, some of you might have heard of. <laughs> uh, there's, um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has a, a fabulous facility, uh, Janelia Farm, in, which is uh, sort of in the outskirts of Washington, D.C., um, that it, they've constructed as a as an independent uh, hub for, mostly for neuroimaging, um, which before Janelia Farm existed, neuroimaging wasn't really so much of a thing, and they, they've really brought together a, a center of excellence that's um, that's made such great strides that now people talk about neuro, neuroimaging as, as being its own field almost. Um, and they, they have a, uh, a model that is similar in some ways to academia, um, in that they, they have groups that are headed by principal investigators who have PhDs. Um, it sort of resembles a university uh, architecturally. Um, but their uh, their focus, like the way that the way that they've uh, they have so many people in one subfield, and also the the way that um, they evaluate uh, investigators, I think, is uh, is is somewhat different. Um, and they also have a a huge budget internally to fund the people that they pick, uh, rather than. Uh, as, as a university would, collecting overhead from them for using their facilities while in, in, insisting that they get outside grants. Um, so I think that's uh, that's an interesting place. Um, the Santa Fe Institute is interesting. Uh, Michael knows more about that than I do. Um, and uh, let's see. Talk about it some Sure. If I, I mean, uh, how many people have heard about the Santa Fe Institute? Okay, a bunch. Interestingly, quite a, an overlap with uh, people who've heard about Dynamic Land. Um, so this is a little place uh, in Santa Fe, not surprisingly, that was funded, uh, founded in uh, the early 1980s uh, by people, Murray Gell-Mann and Phil Anderson and some other leading uh, physicists and economists, uh, with the idea that they were essentially going to create a new academic field, the field of complex systems. Um, they've existed for 25 years now. They've had an enormous in impact on people who think about those kinds of things. They really have actually created uh, a new field. Uh, let me pick, I think, just one interesting fact about them. Uh, I think when people found new institutes, very often they try and find a field which they're working in. And what tends to happen is that's a, that's a very homogenizing kind of a thing to do because you start to adopt um, the standards of that field. Uh, I've been, uh, I was associated with the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, 
which was kind of a, a several hundred million dollar startup uh, theoretical physics institute. Uh, and as soon as you've decided you're gonna do theoretical physics, in some sense, you're bought into the standards of that field and you start out very different and sort of edgy and interesting in a variety of ways. But over time, you, you sort of adopt the consensus position of the field. In some sense, there's very strong network effects which are caused by your commitment to being an institute for theoretical physics. In the case of the Santa Fe Institute, they have this very interesting situation where they've actually put, it's the Santa Fe Institute for complex systems. They've made this enormous bet, sort of they've, a lot of skin in the game in some sense, by actually naming yourself uh, for the field that you're gonna try and create. Uh, there's no way out of it. They, they have to actually create this field. And I know that over the decades, they've had enormous, uh, let's just say, I think hiring is always very difficult for them because every time, essentially, they have to decide again what they mean by the field of complex systems. And I've no doubt that from the point of view of somebody internally, this is a very frustrating discussion to be having many times a year. But it also means that, that you know, they really are bought into this, this vision uh, and they're continually creating and recreating this notion of, of what the field is. Uh, and I think it's been a, sort of enormously successful, certainly given uh, the amount of money they've spent, which is, is really minuscule compared to a lot of uh, uh, much better funded efforts. It, I'm curious, so there's this thought of, the, going back to incentives for a moment, um, there's a big question in, in reward structures, that once you start using uh, financial systems to reward certain things, the extrinsic incentive will, will drive out the intrinsic incentive to, to search for something. So you see a lot of cases where financial reward ends up being a, um, over time, it, it weeds out the, the quality uh, insights. At the same time, you have this other problem where, because we're not rewarding something, and, and this is one of the contributing factors to why, or I would guess this is one of the contributing factors to why we don't see the rewards in science uh, commensurately, uh, or, or be commensurate with a, with a of value creation in the long term, that some, something went wrong along the way uh, and, and too much emphasis was placed on this because now we have the, the opposite problem where not enough, uh, we don't see enough experimentation and you have some of the most brilliant people on the planet going out to, to uh, you know, build companies or, or you know, the, the famous quote from Jeff Hammerbacker where uh, he said, you know, the brilliant, most brilliant minds of my generation are optimizing ads, where in reality they should be uh, advancing science, they should be creating uh, infrastructure for long term and so on. Um, so uh, how might we, Right, that ship. How might we create incentive structures that that, that yield good science? Well, I think one of the things that um, that affects that is that making an attempt to do foundational basic research is is very high risk. And obviously, doing a startup is also very high risk. Um, but we don't have because the value in the event of success doesn't show up as dollars. We don't have the kind of institutions that you see in venture capital to provide people with the operating capital to go out and take those risks in science, especially as individuals who are just starting out. Can you say what you, what you see as the risk in the case of science? Well, the risk is that your, your vision turned out to be an illusion. Like if you, if, you have a, if you have a concept that you want to develop, you have an experiment that you want to try, um, it, it's usually the case that the more world-shaking the result would be, the less likely it is in advance to be true. And if it turns out not to pan out, then you've ended up spending all of that time and potentially spending a lot of resources along the way, uh, and, and all you have to show for it is some negative results. The same is true in, uh, in, in technology companies as well, though, right? Right. But in technology companies, if you, if you succeed, then there's a financial reward. And that means that there's an infrastructure of, of people who go and support you to go and try to take the risk. And essentially, they're limiting your risk as an individual by doing that. So one of our thoughts around around this has been that the, the distance from, from ideas uh, that yield into theories or, or, or systems that, system designs, uh, is very far removed from the end product that ends up uh, in people's hands. So there's this whole pipeline of going from those ideas into uh, thinking through how it can be used in various kinds of applications, how it can be used to improve infrastructure. Uh, years of work going into developing that, usually with orders of magnitude more people involved, right. because those areas tend to be much more labor intensive, surprisingly. Um, and uh, you know, doing the, it's funny that doing the breakthrough work, to, to take, the breakthrough work takes less labor, uh, human labor, than the, 
taking that breakthrough work and putting it into people's hands. Uh, maybe that's a problem to fix. <laughs> uh, but, but there seems to be this massive lag um, that ends up disconnecting the two. That yeah. somewhere along the road, the, the basic fundamental research did not, um, is not able to capture uh, some of the value created. Yeah. But from a, from, a, from a perspective of information processing, it's very much like the problem of backpropagating a utility signal from the output of a neural network all the way back to the original layers. There might also be a problem with how we measure utility. So one of the yeah. things that we've discussed previously is, um, and like some of the PL people is, uh, and I'll credit Dandelion with coming up with that. Uh, Dandelion's working on source cred. Um, uh, he pointed out that uh, today we measure, uh, we, we use, uh, you know, money as our placeholder for value, and because our math wasn't very good, we used scalars for this. Uh, and the, but maybe we could be using vectors or tensors to encode much higher dimensionality in, in, a, in our notion of value. And that because we have computers now, maybe we could actually develop the economics to, to deal with entire uh, tensors of value, and then we might yield uh, potentially better economies. I, I'm curious what you think of this idea. Uh, I worked on uh, using non-abelian groups, actually, uh, for money. Uh, uh, at one point. Uh, I think it's very interesting because it means that uh, you have uh, uh, usually with any kind of commutative structure, um, if I give you money and then you give me some amount back, it's the same as if we'd done it in the other, in the other order. Um, and this turns out to be important in the proofs of actually, I mean, things like the fundamental theorems of welfare economics in, you know, essentially the modern version of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Um, and if you, as soon as you get rid of that sort of abelian character, uh, that property goes away. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Of course, as far as I know, it's you know that kind of market has, or that kind of uh, 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 currency, or I don't know what even to call it. That kind of system has never been tried. But uh, uh, it's I think it's, to think it's about. a surprisingly good time to try out these ideas, uh, thanks true. to a, a, a small thing going on with cryptocurrencies. Yeah. It turns out that. Uh, these days, you can come up with almost anything and uh, and then create something. So uh, maybe we can do some experiments on this. Uh, curious if you have uh, thoughts on this. So I I do think that collapsing all possible kinds of value that could be created onto a single dimension it, it feels sort of wrong. Um, on the other hand, it, it it does having a having that dimension that numeraire dimension that transfers utility in in, in an approximately linear way is what enables a lot of incentive mechanisms like Vickery Clark Groves to work. Um, and so if you, if you don't have that, if you say instead, oh, there's like 10 ways that things can be good, then you would essentially, in order to have people be able to exchange utility, you would end up having markets emerge to change between the different components of the vector, and then there would be market prices, and effectively you could collapse it back down to a single dimension. But we totally have this environment where people uh, measure utility yeah. Uh, in a bunch of other ways that is not captured in money and end up having to do all this extra calculation on the side of saying, well, this, we can't really collapse this down to dollars or if we did, we, it would lose something. So we, we, on the side, keep an order book uh, uh -huh. of all this stuff and we sort of fudge over the rest and we say, hey, it works out um, and we make sure that all, all, all of the monetary side are, is, is working and then we keep this entire separate economic system uh, in our heads uh, and in, in human relationships and trust and so on. Um, and so I wonder if there might be uh, just something to trying this out. Uh, yeah. Actually, a good question is, what might be good experiments to try this out? In some sense, you're sort of talking about you know, artificially limiting liquidity or something uh, 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 yep. there. So, so maybe this is something for the, for, for the audience to, to think about uh, what experiments might we try uh, to, to play around with these ideas. Uh, they might be about just having enough conversion so that you can always get out of whatever currency you don't like. Uh, mm. And you can always uh, move into, into the currency that you want. Uh, so, uh, I'm curious to, I'm going to steer the ship a different direction now um, and go towards open source. So open source is one of the, I would argue, one of the most fundamental changes to work in, in a long time, uh, probably in the order of 50 years, I would say. Uh, I, th I think the idea of, of working in open source in, in, did, in the digital world, um, it, and you could argue that open source is a lot with, with, of how science used to work, so it's not really that new, but it's certainly new in, in the domain of of just industry. Uh, I think open source completely changed, um, and the success of open source completely changed people's perspective around what it takes to build something. Today, um, we th look at open source uh, systems as clear, the clear winners in building infrastructure uh, in, in the software digital world, uh, but we 
and, and that worked out in the digital landscape. But you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, that would have not been the most people's bets. Most people's bets were actually in the wrong direction. So we can look back to uh, great quotes from uh, people like Bill Gates and others who said, you know, this open source thing is, is clearly not good. It's a cancer. It's going to um, wreck uh, incentive structures, and it's just not going to work out. It's going to be worse software. And that turned out to be completely wrong. Um, it turned out to be open source yields drastically better software. So there's this culture. Uh, is now infecting a whole bunch of other systems as well. And we've seen open source and science. Uh, I'm curious if you, like, maybe what solutions could we draw from there? What, what are the problems there? How can we push scientists to be much more open? There's this issue with um, scooping, right? So, so right now the credit system uh, rewards uh, closed discovery. But, and so most scientists are not open because they can't be. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... Th that's sort of true. Actually, they're extremely open. The only way they can get credit is to openly disclose their results in the form of papers. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, for the first 150 years or so after the creation of the first academic journals, a lot of scientists were very reluctant to publish because that connection hadn't yet been established. Um, and it was just a lot of hard work by uh, a bunch of people. Actually, I mean, very much resembling the kind of work that people like Stallman and and... Lessig and many others did in the 80s and 90s to establish kind of the value system around uh, open source. I think about things like, um, a good example might be something like uh, Math Overflow. Uh, so this is the mathematical version of Stack Overflow. And on many occasions I've heard mathematicians make a comment like, uh, you know, wasting too much time on Math Overflow. Um, I, you know, I, I was just spending my time on Math Overflow. And, it, and this, is, this is insane. Um, or it's, it sort of expresses a crazy system of values. In fact, much of the work which they do there is significantly more interesting and important than the work they do in their uh, published papers. Um, and that's, that, I mean, that's nothing more than a values problem. Uh, if you ch change the values there, uh, which is you know, something that you need to do sort of person by person, you, you can do it in a scalable way through writing and video and, and whatnot. But uh, you know, people just need to change their mind uh, in much the same way as I think you know, that's, that's how open source kind of grew, uh, many, many people starting to internalize this, this kind of ethic. It's kind of a rambling answer, sorry. No, that's great. What did, what did the effort look like for, for making publication in journals be the, the thing? Um, <laughs> it's hard to imagine a time when... Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, some of the, the early uh, days was pretty funny. Um, Henry Oldenburg, who founded what's really the first serious scientific journal, the Proceedings of the Royal Society, oh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, um, uh, used to write to scientists and essentially beg them to, you know, say a little bit about what it was that they were doing. And he would find, in some cases, competitors... Um, and actually write letters backwards and forwards, uh, somewhat deceptive letters, in fact. Uh, 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 he'd sort of egg, egg them on. Such and such sort of suggested to me that, you know, he knew how to do, you know, huh. this kind of a thing, which was maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. But the other person would then actually feel some need uh, to claim that they'd done the same thing. Uh, and kind of bouncing backwards and forwards in this way, uh, Oldenburg would eventually essentially then publish digests of these uh, correspondences that, that he was carrying out. But he was very careful and actually, honestly, very manipulative uh, in his letters. He had a lot of sort of awareness of what, would, what he could do to, to get people to disclose. Um, yeah. And, and this varies right now in science... Uh, pretty drastically, right? So in physics and, and math and uh, computer science, we see much faster uh, publishing through preprints, and that's where the, re the real work is, is going. And something like biology, it's, it's the other way around. It's, uh, you know, insights. There are many insights around um, and just years of investment before it turns out to be successful or not. Uh, of course, people are trying to change that, and there's science in good directions. Uh, but it's still there's this very significant resistance that I, that I encounter that we encounter science people in general encounter, but even I encounter in, in just talking to uh, CS researchers, where there is a, a very significant pressure, on, especially in PhD students, to to have the the big results uh, that they will, that is going to be the big thing that's going to get them uh, a faculty position, and so they tend to be pretty guarded with with uh, with with their insights. And so, how might we? What might be good? Small levers we can push to to show people the value that they that they could tap into um, and get people to try this out. So one interesting thing that happened in open source was GitHub um, created a, an avenue to 
very easily host open source code. So one of the greatest contributions uh, that GitHub Editor had was just how easy it was to put all of your code there and to charge you for not opening it up. So right away, tons of stuff that would have been private because there used to be the stigma around um, how good, high quality your, your code was, went away because people were like, hey, it's just free hosting, so I don't care about people look at it. I don't care, and yeah, sure, if you wanna use it, go ahead. And then right away, that just was a total hack to get tons of open source produced, and it brought everyone into the same place. I wonder if, if uh, there is something like this for science, um, that, or at least in some scientific fields, that you think might be, like, could be built in the, in the short term. I guess I'm a little distrustful of uh, silver bullet solutions. There's lots of um, sort of uh, partial silver bullets. Uh, one thing that has been very successful uh, has been instances where uh, there's some artifact that clearly should be shared. And very often the grant agencies have intervened, when, when they've done it well, they've intervened really with the consent and, and assistance of the community. Probably a big success actually was the human genome. Um, there was a period when it looked like that might actually be kept as private data. Uh, the Wellcome Trust and, and some other agencies actually convened all the leading human genome scientists uh, in Bermuda uh, and essentially sort of suggested that they should sit around and, and uh, talk about how they would... The boundary condition was set. They were going to be disclosing their data, but then there were questions about exactly how that should be done. And after a few days of discussion, they decided actually that they would release the data within 48 hours uh, of taking the data, um, and it would be put uh, on GenBank, so where anybody in the world can can download it. And I mean, that, I think that kind of thing, kind of instigated by the grant agencies, but actually, you know, where a lot of the decision making was actually made by the scientists themselves, um, is a pretty good example. I mean, it was an, obviously it's an enormous success. That's one of the, you know, the best things that's that's happened uh, in a long time. Um, but that, that's an interesting model anyway for, for, for the future. Um, I mean, a lot of science, in, in especially in computer science, is, is being done on GitHub uh, and quite a bit of math as well. Um, it's harder with the types of science where uh, the, the actual artifacts that you're producing along the way are not digital in, in form. Um, although, of course, one can imagine with robotic labs and these sorts of things that a byproduct of that, although the investment probably is only justifiable in other ways, but a byproduct of that is that if you have the same sort of model where you can do experiments at, for free or at vastly discounted cost, if you make the results immediately public, um, that sort of thing might, might, might happen there. Um, there's also, you know, people write papers on overleaf, I suppose, but you don't really even get to the point of writing a paper in a lot of cases before you've, you've done a lot of the work. Um, we, we've talked about uh, annotating papers as a community activity uh, that can be done online. Um, and having, you know, in some situations there are some, some groups, most academic groups, who want to keep a database of annotations private to their group, but the same sort of model could be applied there where we allow people to annotate papers for free if they're open to the public, but if they want to have a private group, they'll, they're charged for keeping those notes and comments private. And it, it, I think these days, it's pretty hard and expensive to move a lot of scientific data around. So even in maybe the bio and other areas, um, we, if there was, an idea might be, and validate this before anyone puts any significant effort into this, might be, um, make it extremely easy to host data and share it and, and do research on it uh, with your collaborators, um, but vastly cheaper to do it if you open up the data for everybody. So uh, there might be, I've seen a couple of products that do this kind of thing, um, but it's not quite there yet. I think it's still, I am astounded at the degree of scientist time that is wasted on translating between data formats yeah. and get putting the bits of their research up onto the internet in a way that's digestible and downloadable. Mm -hmm. and this is totally a solvable problem. Um, funnily enough, it's the, the reason IPFS exists. Uh, there was originally meant to be a data set package manager to try and solve that problem. And it, there's like a big detour. Uh, so maybe maybe we should go back to that. To that. So maybe, maybe all of us should just start hacking on that today. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, I'm going to open up for, for questions, unless you have anything to add to that. Uh, I want to open up to questions for the, from the audience.
um, and then we'll we'll conclude uh, after that. A few questions. Um, raise your hands, and then we'll get somebody with the mic coming over, um, because I think you we need a. Do we have another mic to to hand to them? If there we go. I'm just dying to find out um, with all the intelligence and all the billions of people on the planet uh, after Nikola Tesla, why haven't we been able to reproduce the reported energy advantages that he found? Energy production advantages that he found. Why isn't that a... Maybe keep that one and then hand it over yeah. to the next person. Uh, well, Tesla's lab is an interesting one. It's one that hasn't come up yet. Um, we, uh, people talk a lot about Bell Labs and Park. Uh, sometimes people talk about Edison's lab. Tesla also had a lab. I haven't looked into much of the history of, of his process there. Um, so there might be interesting things to learn from that. I think most of the accounts that are reported of, of the discoveries that Tesla made in his lab are exaggerated, um, often dramatically. <laughs> um, but some of them, uh, I, I think, were, were not, and were well ahead of his time. So uh, maybe some things to learn there. My answer is, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Hey, um, so when you're talking about the sort of open-ended um, creation of knowledge that's not bounded in time, um, there are sort of these, these coupled knowledge creation processes, right? Um, one is the creation of fundamental knowledge, and the other is the creation of practical knowledge that ensures that you're going to be able to indefinitely create fundamental knowledge. Um, so do you have thoughts about um, structural ways of tying those two together that people either are trying right now that are interesting, um, or things that people should be doing that they aren't yet? What's an example from the past of that kind of tying together? An example from the past? Um, well, so... Um, uh, the government is funded by taxing the economy, um, and Vannevar Bush showed that we should start organizations like the NIH um, or the, uh, the the NSF that um, systematically take some of that that value created, economic value created, and put that back into fundamental research. Um, and then, I mean, Y Combinator Labs, obviously, um, you know, and and Protocol Labs are, are other sort of models for that. But is that is that the the way you think about it? And what are other examples that people should try? It's, it's yeah. I think I think I think there's something to that. That uh, there at a large scale, a reinvestment needs to be made in order to keep the pipeline flowing from the beginning of fundamental research. Um, and there are various structures at various scales in which you can do that. So you can do it at at the government level, which is sort of the highest feasible level where you take the output of the entire economy and assign a chunk of that back into the pipeline of research. Or you can do it at a level like Y Combinator, which aggregates up uh, a, a significant portion of a sector of the economy. Or you can do it, you know, as Protocol Labs does, at, at, or as Bell Labs did, as a single corporation. Um, I'm not sure if there's any single answer as to which one of these is best. Um, I think there probably are advantages to each of them. And they're, they're, it makes sense to have an ecosystem of reinvestment at different scales, but I haven't thought about this too much. I think historically, it's just true. Um, although there's often sort of decentralized sources of funding, uh, there's always centralized. There's always been centralized signing authority. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so you know, we collect taxes, but ultimately it's program officers, uh, whatever. Um, or there's some very wealthy person who sets up a foundation, the Sloan Foundation or the Gates Foundation or whatever, and again, they have a program officer uh, structure, and so there's a lot of sort of individual authority. Um, some of the most interesting, it's, it's more or less research work that I know of that's going on now is being funded through Patreon, uh, which is, you know, that's sort of the first time almost in human history that uh, you know, centralized models have actually worked there. Yeah. I don't think they're working that great yet, but it's very early days. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting, and I, I think what I, what I like about it anyway, I'm a big fan of uh, Grant Sanderson's uh, YouTube channel, uh, Three Blue, One Brown. It's fantastic. Most people wouldn't think of this actually really as a research thing. I think of it as a research thing. What he's doing is he's solving unsolved expository problems. Uh, and he's doing an amazing job of it. And he's actually being funded really well. 
through Patreon. Uh, I'd love it, you know, if that was scaled up by a factor of 10 or 100 or 1,000, uh, that would start to be a very significant uh, change to, to how science is done. Second plug for his channel. If you do not know the 3 Blue One brand channel, go check it out. It's an, an excellent way to do explanation. We had an interesting exercise uh, internally where we were thinking of, um, we're going to hire a blog writer to uh, produce a, a, some blog posts for us uh, on Filecoin. And I went through the, the thought exercise of how would we value the, the output uh, of, this, of this writing. And the way that I thought about it was uh, instead of thinking, OK, well, what, are, what is the labor um, metric, uh, the, the normal economic labor metric of how much you would pay a block writer, I instead thought about things like Grant Sanderson's work um, and uh, Chris Ola's fantastic uh, series, uh, in, you can find it on his blog and other places, and distill.pub and so on, and thought, well, what if we just try to quantify the, the return, the, the, the ROI of, of this blog, blog post? And so try to think of what is the value created by that single instance, and then back calculate from that what, uh, so, so how much value is created, how much value is captured by us, how much value, what ROI do we want to get, is it a 10x that we want to get, is it a 100x, which is a, the number we can play with, um, and then what does that yield, right? And it, it, it re yielded some astounding numbers that uh, I'm, I'm putting together into, I'm going when to, I, when I get some free time, uh, I'm going to try and, and, and write a, uh, an essay about. Now, how much is that worth? Uh, so, so it would be it would be great to uh, to get some help on this. So, if you're interested in this question, uh, come talk to me. Uh, but, but I want to show uh, that, that it's you can get an astounding amount of return uh, of on investment for lots of groups, especially anybody trying to hire anybody in machine learning, for example, on just getting people to understand machine learning better, to be able to be better machine learning researchers and so on. Um, that's, a, that's one example. Like Chris Ola's posts um, are, are astoundingly valuable. Uh, I, I would wager and could with a, with a very sane like 10x or 100x ROI perspective could you, you could fund a whole team of chrysolas uh, just churning out amazingly valuable material and, and ideally you know overlapping in some areas but you can cover much more grounds uh, or, or you know a hundred uh, 10 to 100 grand Sanderson's across a whole bunch of different fields producing extremely valuable work for a surprisingly small amount of capital investment um, and so uh, I'll put a note on that, on like TBD. Uh, the thing that I, w that I wanted to to also flag is is I think all of this is backprop. Or, or right now we we are in a world where the government has to you know we we see the economy going and then the government has to kind of collect from everywhere and say we think it's valuable to reinvest it over here and and keep keep the whole thing going. Um, and we also see enlightened people doing that with their own personal fortune. So the the people um, that started foundations they saw the drastic value in improving um, uh, society and, and funding things like fundamental research and so on. Uh, but, but that seems like a, like a the catch-all solution. That seems like a great valve to have to make sure the whole thing is working. But it should not be the first one. Uh, there, there seems to be something drastically wrong here. And, and I, I think it's just backprop. We have something going wrong with this. It should be possible to backpropagate the, the rewards. So this further pushes me in the direction of, of credit assignment and things like that, uh, and in having more experiments. So if the people in this room want to try out experiments in this direction, like we should fund those. Like we as Protocol Labs should fund those. Uh, so anyway, uh, other questions or do we, responses? Uh, yeah, I've got two questions. Uh, sure. Uh, so the first one, uh, do you think maybe a large part of the reason why basic science isn't better remunerated is to Typically, the people who are doing the basic science aren't motivated at all, in some cases, by money and more by either the beauty of the material or reputation. So people like Perelman, who flat, flat out refused monetary rewards for quite groundbreaking work. So, yeah, I mean, I just want to start by questioning the premise a little bit. You say it's not well remunerated. It's interesting to break that down and think about what that actually means. We spend about $100 billion a year on uh, basic science. That's an astounding amount of money uh, to be spending. And I mean, a huge fraction of the people who are being funded are essentially free to direct themselves to do what they want, or in fact, in many cases, even just to show up. Um, uh, uh, so 
really, in some sense, what you're talking about is the structure of the labor market. You're not actually talking about the overall scale of it. You're talking about how do how do we organize that uh, internally. Um, uh, I think sort of good news there is that, in fact, that's an, essentially an internal governance issue. People can just change that if they, uh, 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 if they want. We have this interesting tension between sort of Matthew effect type things where, um, you know, the rich get richer, um, which, you know, I think some subset of us anyway identified as a negative uh, thing. But in fact, that's exactly the mechanism which generates these kind of outsized rewards inside a labor market. Um, so uh, I'm not really providing a any kind of solution or answer to your question. I'm pointing out, however, though, that there's, I think, an interesting tension inside the the, the question. Um, Want to actually go make it more remunerative for some individuals? Um, you're going to be, you know, essentially pushing more money in their direction, which means pushing less money in other people's uh, direction. Is that? Are you absolutely sure that that's what you want? Uh, cool. And the second question was more specific, uh, Michael. You mentioned about your. Hello, you think you'd been thinking about uh, using non-abelian groups-based currency? Have you c considered taking that further to non-associative or non-distributive things like quaternions or octonions? <laughs> <laughs> Funny you should mention that. Uh, <coughs> no, not seriously. Um, uh, the octonions are incredibly hard to think about because they're non-associative. Um, uh, I, I have no good model. Um, uh, I'm just, I mean. I haven't done this seriously. It's just been goofing around with uh, some non-abelian groups. It's kind of fun. Things like the, um, you know, the famous fact that, that you know, if you have multiple currencies, um, inevitably a market arises and you end up with an exchange rate, so they're really all the same thing. It's not true for currencies. It's kind of a fun fact. But I, I don't have anything. I don't, you know, it's just playing around. If you were to to uh, design some experiments that could be run by say two or three people, um, in without needing to like build a lot, but say you imagine pairing some software engineers with um, designers and products, and you could you know ship out some product because uh, turns out software is quite cheap today. Uh, if, if you were to design some experiments, what a uh, what would you like to try and find out? Like what, what would be like interesting experiments you would like to to design? Uh, to just have run. So, so, sorry, this is like not a well articulated enough question. Uh, it, specifically in the context we've been talking about, in terms of how, how, how do we fix science, how do we fix science incentives, uh, what are some of these? What are some of the questions you have that you would like to to test out? I mean, there, what happens when you inject a lot more variance into the system? Um, I mean, just to pick up random example from before, but it's a very natural thing to want to do. Um, the standard sort of way in which uh, ideas are evaluated, you know, somebody makes a grant proposal, it's sent out for review, there's a bunch of scores associated to it, uh, you compute something like the average of those scores and that determines a lot, it's not the final word, uh, but it determines a lot about what gets funded. A very natural thing to do is, in fact, to consider, rather than the, the average, to consider something like the variance or the kurtosis. Um, sort of on the principle that, uh, in fact, many of the most interesting ideas are things which, uh, you know, one or two people believe are just fantastic and several other people absolutely hate. Uh, Werner Heisenberg, uh, in his PhD, was given an A by one professor and an F by his other professor. Uh, for a, He just barely scraped a pass. He got a C. Uh, if he would have done pretty, he did pretty badly on the average, but he did very well in terms of uh, uh, the variance. So, you know, that's a, a simple experiment. I've actually pitched it to a number of grant agencies. Um, the response is always the same. The person laughs. They get the point. Uh, they think it's interesting, but they're not willing to do it. This is actually maybe next to your incentive uh, point. If they were going to be sufficiently well rewarded for doing a strange experiment like that, uh, maybe they'd be a little bit more motivated to do it. My intuition with this is that changing the way that science is done on a large scale isn't quite a software problem. 
um, and I would I would be more interested in experiments sort of with writing, uh, like in in the in the style of well, not literally the style, but in the spirit of someone like Stallman um, trying to advance an ideology about how science should be done, uh, trying to articulate um, concepts uh, like idea rights uh, and things like that, um, and trying to see you know what 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 might catch on. Uh, and I think there's also um, I think there's also quite a bit of leverage to be had in uh, just using uh, some strange selection criteria and publicizing them widely and funding one or two groups along that as an experiment. And then there is a uh, I think I think what people are missing in order to do this kind of thing is not so much the software tooling to keep track of it as the um, the credibility or sort of the uh, the social will. And uh, a final question to, to end with some suggestions for the audience. Uh, what field or idea are you most excited about or were you recently most excited about? I'm probably most disturbed here from somebody who has a startup which aims to produce antimatter at scale. Uh, antimatter at scale. Um, so they believe they have a process for doing it, uh, which if you're interested in rocketry and you know going to other solar systems is pretty exciting. Uh, unfortunately, of course, you know when you actually work out the numbers um, and think about the use in potential use in, ter in terrestrial uh, bombs, uh, yeah, it's uh, not so great there. Uh, so I'm not sure whether I'm excited or absolutely terrified. A <laughs> uh, lot of the things that. I'm interested in lately, uh, like adjoint logic and gradual type theory are things that I don't think I have much of a hope of convincing anyone to be interested in uh, in a short period of time. Um, but one suggestion that I would make is the thing that I used to work on, which is um, modeling small nervous systems um, by, by doing uh, optical interrogation. I think there's still a lot of interesting directions to go there. Uh, I think that uh, go, going for full models um, is still underexplored. There are tools like expansion microscopy, um, better calcium indicators. Uh, people are doing light sheet imaging and full zebrafish larvae, um, but they're but they're not they're not going out and saying, "All right, we're going to try and make a model of this thing." Um, so, if anyone is uh, is up for that, I don't think it would be worth doing. Uh, thank you very much, and this is the end of the section. Um, the, th thank you very much for, for being uh, part of this. I uh, really appreciate you uh, taking the time and sharing your thoughts and knowledge. Uh, hopefully we, this won't be the last and we'll have more discussions to come. Uh, I think uh, so far we have not succeeded in uh, fixing science, but maybe if we keep this up in, uh, in a very long time and a lot of other people that will watch this and will uh, do, run some experiments and think about this and run their own conversations, we'll, uh, maybe we'll get there in a bunch of years. So uh, thank you very much and uh, a round of applause.